TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem. And in today's top stories, unidentified aircraft targeted numerous Syrian installations that are manned by Iranian proxy militias overnight. An attack Damascus officials were quick to attribute to the Israeli Air Force. Turkey is making extensive efforts to assure that by the year 2023, when it is set to celebrate the 100th anniversary of its republic, its first Russian-built nuclear reactor would become operational. Tensions between Turkey and the European Union are steadily rising over respective Eastern Mediterranean activities. Unidentified aircraft targeted numerous Syrian installations that are manned by Iranian proxy militias overnight. An attack Damascus officials were quick to attribute to the Israeli Air Force. The attack occurred at approximately 10 minutes before midnight when a barrage of sophisticated missiles penetrated Syria's aerial defense array, striking a number of military installations simultaneously in the vicinity of the town of Waina south of the border city of Kunetra, as well as in a mountainous area called Jabal al Mania, between the villages of al Adliya, al Harjela, and Der Ali, which are situated south of the Syrian capital Damascus. While Syrian authorities confirmed significant material damage, the London-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights reported that at least eight Iranian-backed militants of nationalities other than Syrian were killed in the alleged Israeli attack. It further reported that large amounts of missiles and other weapons controlled by the Iranian proxy militias were destroyed. Meanwhile, in response to TV7's request for comment, the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm nor deny its responsibility. It is interesting to know that last night's attack was a second such strike within less than a week and a 36 aerial bombardment against Iranian Quds Force, Hezbollah and other proxy militias in Syria, which were attributed to the Israeli Air Force over the course of this year alone. In related news, while the leadership in Tehran is making extensive efforts to appear confident in the face of Western scrutiny, it is reportedly making extensive efforts to alleviate any prospects of a possible American attack. According to a number of reports which were confirmed today to TV7 by Western intelligence officials, the commander of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard's elite Quds Force, Brigadier General Ismail Ghani, traveled to Iraq last week to brief a number of militia commanders loyal to Tehran, during which he instructed them to immediately halt any attacks against U.S. installations during the course of an expected political transition period in the United States. According to a source familiar with the details, the instructions came from the top amid real concerns within the inner circle of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei over prospects of an American attack that would incapacitate Iran's military infrastructure. And while the intelligence officials TV7 spoke with insisted that prospects of such an attack are highly unlikely, they confirmed that miscalculation could quickly alter the equation. Turning to Washington, D.C., where U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo commanded his Kuwaiti counterpart, Ahmad Nasser al-Muhammad al-Sabah, for his country's support of the maximum pressure campaign against the Ayatollah regime in Tehran, emphasizing the crucial efforts of denying Tehran resources which would enable its terror activities. Our two nations are also united on the challenges of our time. We fought together to defeat ISIS's fraudulent caliphate and we're aligned in countering the Iranian regime as well. And I want to thank Kuwait for its support of the maximum pressure campaign. Together we are denying Tehran money, resources, wealth, weapons with which they would be able to commit terror acts all across the region. The Kuwaiti top diplomat for his part hailed his country's strong relations with the United States and highlighted the perpetual gratitude of Kuwait City for Washington's key role and liberating it from Iraqi occupation some 29 years ago. Next year will mark two events, important events, will mark 30 years of uh, the liberation of Kuwait, where the United States 
in the leadership of the United States guided a coalition of 35 nations around the world in maintaining international security and international law, law in liberating uh, Kuwait. The second referred to event will mark 60 years of the establishment of the diplomatic relationship between Kuwait and the United States. Turning to Jerusalem, where Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that he intends to travel to the Kingdom of Bahrain in the near future after holding a phone conversation with Bahraini Crown Prince Salman bin Hamad al Khalifa. <laughs> השיחה השנייה שלנו מאוד ידידותית, שנינו מאוד נרגשים מהעובדה שאנחנו יכולים להביא את פירות השלום לעמים שלנו, למדינות שלנו, בזמן קצר מאוד, ולכן הוא גם הזמין אותי בזמן הקרוב לבוא לביקור רשמי בבחריין, ואני אעשה זאת בשליחותכם בחפץ לב. Turning to Turkey, where the country is making extensive efforts to assure that by the year 2023, when it is set to celebrate the 100th anniversary of its republic, its first Russian-built nuclear reactor would become operational. According to the vice general manager of the Russian construction company, in charge of building Turkey's first nuclear reactor, they are making every effort to reach the intended target date in accordance with an agreement between Ankara and Moscow. The referred to intergovernmental agreement was signed between Turkey and Russia in May of 2010 for a QUNPP, a first nuclear plant of Turkey that will have four VVER 1200 power reactors with a total installed capacity of 4,800 megawatts. The plan's groundbreaking ceremony was held on April 3, 2018, with the participation of Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, via video conference from Ankara. In other news related to Turkey, tensions are seemingly on the rise between Ankara and the European Union, after German forces operating under the EU military mission Irini boarded a Turkish cargo ship suspected of smuggling weapons to Libya. Speaking to reporters in the Turkish capital Ankara, Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu said his ministry summoned the envoys of the European Union, Germany and Italy over the search of the Turkish flagged ship, which Ankara condemned as illegal under international law, and vowed to take additional steps against the European Union in accordance with directives from Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Avrupa Bildi Almanya ve İtalya'nın büyük elçilerini de bakanlığa çağırdık ve bakan yardımcısı Sedat Bey görüştü, notamızı da verdik. Bu işin siyasi boyutunu, hukuki boyutunu da takip edeceğiz. Yani e, bu işin peşini e, bırakmayacağız. Daha sonra arkadaşlarımız yazılı olarak protestoyu gönderince bu sefer mesajımızı aldık, yarıda bırakıp dönüyoruz, çıkıyoruz e, dediler ve süreci zaten siz Efendim? biliyorsunuz. It is important to know that Turkey has been opposed to the EU's Irini naval mission since it launched the mission in 2016 as part of a mandate under Security Council Resolution 2292 to thwart the transfer of weapons into war-torn Libya. Since Ankara openly supported the Tripoli-based Government of National Accord with advanced weaponry and mercenaries, the EU naval mission has repeatedly challenged Turkey's persistent efforts. Meanwhile, the European Union rejected Turkey's claim, stating, quote, 
Operation Irini is a concrete contribution to international efforts to help to end the conflict in Libya. It has demonstrated its ability to monitor arms embargo violations on both sides of the conflict in Libya, and it reports accordingly to the UN Sanctions Committee. It further noted about the incident earlier this week that Operation Irini had made good-faith efforts to seek the consent of the flag state by giving the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs a four-hour notice in line with international maritime practice. Operation Irini even agreed to extend this notice by an additional hour at the request of the Turkish embassy in Rome, where Operation Irini's headquarters are located. Having received no answer from Turkey after the elapsed time, Operation Irini boarded the vessel and inspected it in accordance with internationally agreed procedures, including NATO procedures. Operation Irini's boarding team acted with the highest degree of professionalism, and no incident was registered throughout the action. The statement further noted that the inspection was suspended later on, when Turkey formally and with delay notified Operation Irini of its refusal to grant the permission to inspect the vessel. Thank you for watching us. As part of TV7 Israel's prayer initiative, I would like to encourage you today to join myself and the team here in Jerusalem to lift up Indonesia in prayer for its salvation and peace, alongside prayers for our persecuted brethren throughout Africa, the Middle East and Far East, in addition to our ongoing prayers, of course, for the peace of Jerusalem, the salvation of Israel, and for all those who are impacted by the corona contagion and its numerous ramifications worldwide. Separately, I would like to thank all of you who partner with TV7 Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan, wishing you an Erev Tovu Mevorach, and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.